Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to New America. My name is Thomas Gideon. I'm a senior staff technologist here with the Open Technology Initiative. Uh, I just, before we get started, a quick note about logistics. Uh, do please avail yourself of the refreshments if you haven't already. And if you're interested in purchasing one of Corey's books, again, if you didn't notice the books on the way in, uh, Clara's out there and would be happy to uh, help you with that transaction. I will leave some time at the end, uh, as Corey was saying, very conveniently on mic, uh, for anyone who would like to get it, uh, copies of books signed. Um, so the last time I had the pleasure of introducing Cory Doctorow in this very space, he gave a particularly rousing talk, urging caution and how we craft policy when dealing with the near limitless potential uh, represented by the network digital computer. In my experience, Cory is incredibly generous with his time, resulting in a wealth of such talks, usually recorded and shared after the fact and often live streamed, such as we're doing today. Uh, his prowess as a public speaker is merely one facet for which he is known. Novelist, blogger, lifelong activist, so begins the litany nearly every time he's introduced. Today we're going to delve into an aspect of Corey that I don't think receives near as much attention as it deserves. Three years ago? Was content three years ago? Mm -hmm. Okay, three years ago, content was released, collecting essays that Corey has written for outlets such as The Guardian, Locus, and Publishers Weekly. As prolific as he is a novelist, a speaker, and a curator at Boing Boing, he is just as prolific in mining where, sorry, lost my, <laughs> mining the trends and potential issues emerging in our increasingly network mediated world. His essays 201 aren't so much predictions as they are laser sharp spotlights illuminating much of what we take for granted in an online world awash in distractions of all kinds. His new essay collection, Context, gathers a fresh crop of insights, just as keen and relevant as the last set, adding to the mix of copyright concerns, the potential of 3D te printing technology, the risks of closed technology stacks, and business models both floundering and thriving. Corey shares how this digital stew is shaping his latest role as a geek dad. Welcome back to New America, Corey. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate your uh, sharing your lunch hour with us. Um, so I have a few questions for Corey to kind of warm up and, and get started, but promise to not to completely monopolize his time. I'll save a, a generous portion at the end for your questions. Uh, once we do open up for audience questions, uh, again, I will remind you that we are recording and live streaming, so if you'd be patient and wait for uh, someone to bring a mic to you so we can capture your question as well. Oh, yes, you may, and John has pointed out, you may record. Is that what you were asking? I was suggesting people... Oh, turn their phones off. Oh, I thought you were asking if, if you could record. Both of those things are okay. Turning off your ringer is a good idea, and, and uh, you know, you're more than welcome to make your own recording of this. Excellent. Um, so the first couple of essays in context delve into your relatively new experience as a dad, as I pointed out, and your recent forays as a writer into young adult fiction. Uh, these essays generally have been optimistic. Are there things that keep you up at night now that you have a personal stake in the upcoming generations? Well, so there's, a, there's a couple of things that, um, apart from the normal parenting kicking your ass stuff that, uh, that we've come up with, th that um, worry me. One thing in particular arose recently as I was thinking about the proposal in the UK to uh, have an opt-out sensor wall uh, for, that all the ISPs in the UK are going to administer for uh, so-called adult content. So when you sign up for a new internet connection in the UK, they're, um, they're going to ask you, do you want to block adult content or not? Uh, which is kind of like saying, you know, have you stopped beating your wife yet? I mean, no one's gonna, no one's gonna want to say to someone on the phone, oh yes, I, I really like adult content. Uh, by all means, leave my adult content on because I love that adult content. So it's the really kind of a, a move to shut this down. And the category of adult content is very broad, um, including things like uh, gambling sites, but also GBLT sites and re reproductive health sites, and a lot of things that aren't what we think of when we think of adult content. When we th when we see an adult bookstore, for example, but um, my daughter is now kind of big enough to drive her own uh, tablet. So she's, we've got a couple of uh, different Android tablets around the house. And, you know, we sit her down with YouTube often and she'll say, you know, she has some cartoons she likes. She's on a huge Max Fleischer Popeye kick, which I'm immensely gratified by as a dad because, oh my God, those are good cartoons. And so she'll, she'll just sort of blip into them and then she'll follow the um, suggested videos and kind of direct her own stuff. And we're, we're always in the room when she's doing it. And every now and again, she'll go from like Peppa Pig to Peppa Pig in Spanish, to Peppa Pig in Russian, to Peppa Pig that someone's overdubbed with cursing. And uh, when that happens, or Peppa Pig with lots of violence in it, or Peppa Pig with something else that's kind of gross. And when that happens, what always ends, what, what she always does, you know, t universally, is she, is she 
flicks away to something else. She's not very interested in it. And if she doesn't flick away, then we immediately go over and say, that's not really what you're looking for. Let me help you get back kind of to the middle of the search cluster so you can find another vector to move out on. And so she never brings it up, right? It's not like that night in bed. She says, Daddy, what did those words mean? Or, you know, Daddy, um, why was Peppa Pig being so mean to George? Uh, she she just, just kind of rolls off her back. All, all the stuff that we're kind of worried about will, like, uh, immediately and, and permanently break our children doesn't seem to make a, a, a dent in her. But the other day, I was sat at the other end of the sofa from her, and I heard something really weird coming out of her tablet. It was a Barbie ad. And she doesn't watch TV. Well, we have you know, recorded TV and DVDs and PVRs and stuff, but we don't have like live TV. I, I'd, I'd actually forgotten there was such a thing a little, a little while ago. And so something newsworthy happened, and I couldn't get online to watch it on the, on the uh, internet. And a friend said, well, why don't you watch it on the news? And I said, well, I didn't TiVo it. I haven't TV How can I watch it on the news? They said they have live news, too. <laughs> um, so, so, she's, she, you know, so she was sitting there watching these Barbie ads, and she was mesmerized. And for the first time ever, when I said, here, Posey, let me take the tablet and redirect your search a little, she said no. And in fact, we had a huge, huge fight about it. And moreover, for the first time, something that I asked her to stop watching became something that she started demanding to watch over and over and over again. And what struck me was that there's all these proposals for parental filters, but none of them are about blocking the only thing that as a parent I feel like my kid wants to see and I don't want her to see yet, or at least not without close supervision. And so clearly she's going to uh, bust out of our capacity to oversee her networked habits pretty quickly. I mean, if not, if not you know, next year or within the next three or four years, I would, I would absolutely expect that there would be times when she was using network devices unsupervised because it's for the same reason she'll be wearing shoes unsupervised, you know. And um, the challenge is going to be figuring out how to get her into the right place with that stuff, uh, particularly because I'm reasonably certain that not long after she masters um, using a device without our supervision, she will master defeating any controls we put on that device to use it without our supervision. And um, I, I really feel like. Um, uh, I don't know what to do then, pr particularly because I, I don't think any of the technical measures would actually work. So I kind of feel like if I'm going to put some kind of sensorware or something on my daughter's computer, it should at least work. And I don't think it will. Uh, so that's, that's the challenge that I feel looming up before me at the moment. I'm also put in mind of a, a conversation we had when you were here uh, last year in terms of kind of uh, her, her critical engagement. Does that change the, the color of that? Where uh, just that, that, that question that no doubt hovers in many people's mind is like, oh, would, how distraught would you be if Posey grew up to be an entertainment industry executive or maybe yeah. even an advertising <laughs> executive? Yeah, I mean, that stuff. But, I, but there's, there's a, hang in there. There's, there's a good counterintuition right. counter I want you to share. Yeah, but then sure. I mean, I, I, I kind of feel like um, uh, if she was someone who had a, a strong maximalist position on copyright, she would at least be a combatant as opposed to a civilian, right? That's my, that's my fear, is that she grew up to be a civilian, that she grew up to actually have no opinion at all about what I see as some of the burning issues of the day. I, I always thought, uh, you remember that uh, terrible 80s sitcom, uh, Family Ties? <laughs> And they had the they had the you know the liberal parents and that they had a Reaganite son and kind of a bubblehead daughter who was only interested in um, you know fashion and 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 you know this very shallow gloss on things and the daughter was always kind of the one who was close to them and the and the Reaganite son was the one who was uh, seen as an opposition to him when you actually watch the show and sort of parse it out closely though they have something meaningful to talk about with their Reaganite son they have more or less nothing to say to the daughter. It's actually, you know, incredibly horrible in terms of its gender presentation as well. But, but you know, so long as she's not a civilian, I, I'm a happy man. <laughs> I, we may have to revisit that <laughs> when, yeah. we're, when we're back here and, you know, uh, 15 years or so, 15, 20 years yeah. or so. Yeah, there we go. Um, to, to, to switch tax a little bit, I was curious, uh, because you do spend a portion of the collection uh, kind of writing up your, your own approach to, to the things that you do, to curation, to, to writing, mm -hmm. uh, both, both your, your fiction and your nonfiction. Um, uh, how do you, uh, also even, geez, just uh, kind of your uh, take on, on being an infovore, you know, triaging and managing your inbox mm -hmm. uh, without inadvertently <laughs> airing t uh, too strongly on, on clobbering conversations you actually do want to have. Um, I, I actually, I kind of find it fascinating in the same way that I like, like, police procedurals on, on television. Um, is, is there t more to it, though, in, in writing on those topics than, than the, the deadline pressure to come up with a topic? 
um, uh, or is there an, a particular audience that, that well, you're, you're speaking some to? Some of those are written for writers. Uh, they came out in Publishers Weekly or Locus, and certainly there's a, there's a certain um, trade interest in doing it. But I think that, the, that, that writers are just kind of a microcosm for uh, what we're all going through as we try to find a way to manage the, the multiple streams of information coming in. You know, Clay Shirky says, you don't have, a, you don't have an information overload problem, you have a um, uh, filter problem. And, you know, it, as much as I sometimes feel like I don't have a filter problem, I really do have an information overload problem, I, I prefer the information overload problem to the alternative, which is uh, a paucity of information sources. I don't know how you get to merely just the high grade ones without getting all the dross too. And so, uh, and so navigating that stuff, navigating authority, all the rest of it, these are like super important questions here in the 21st century, particularly as we, we um, start talking about what the future is going to be. Uh, you know, uh, understanding how to, how to make sense of all the different channels in a world in which monolithic news sources are falling away in favor of um, either, either atomic news sources, individuals, or news sources pulled in from f that you may not be familiar with. So you may be now getting your news about the Indian subcontinent directly from the Times of India because it's a highly ranked result for, um, for uh, searches on the region. But do you know what its character is in the way that you know what the Washington Post's character is, the New York Times character is? Negotiating all that authority is really hard, and particularly hard, as Rebecca Brooks points out in her new book, um, she talks about how, although America doesn't have a, a state media the way that other countries do with the BBC or the CBC, m there's more per capita spending on public relations for the American military and the American government than there is per capita spending for media in all those other countries. And, and Brooks talks about this as essentially the American public media. American public media is press relations on behalf of the state. Um, they they kind of cut out the middleman and just, just sort of try to shift the debate that way. And, and that is becoming much more part of our discussion, especially in the era of WikiLeaks, um, as the story of WikiLeaks is being very deliberately sh changed and, and steered, uh, not just by uh, the press and not just by WikiLeaks ideological opponents, but by an enormous and extremely well-financed uh, press apparatus in this country that, that's run by the state. It's not a conspiracy theory. I mean, they, they were issuing press releases. We know that they were. And, and um, you know, the conspiracy theory part of it is that when Anonymous broke into H.B. Uh, Gary's computers, the security consultants, and published their email dumps, we saw that H.B. Gary was bidding on a U.S. Air Force contract to produce astroturfing software that would allow each individual to control up to 20 online accounts to help steer debate. So do you... Uh, can we expect perhaps a, a more direct approach to that sort of question of media literacy, vetting of sources, understanding, and considering the source? Or do you think that that's already sufficiently covered and, and what you talk about in terms of uh, kind of how you deal with this info uh, ecosystem mm. is, is complementary to what's already out there? No, it's definitely a, a subject that's, that's much more uh, in my mind these days. Um, yeah, the, the themes of it are coming up a lot in the book I'm working on now. I'm working on a sequel to Little Brother, and so th this is a theme that recurs in, in the book because he's, he's part of a story, but he's also watching the story get steered by, by various people. Um, and that negotiation of authority is also particularly important as we see libraries under attack because librarians, of course, are the, their major job isn't shelving books. It's navigating authority and showing people how to navigate authority. And as the library uh, trade becomes uh, m more and more in discredit as a kind of uh, casualty of the war on government services and the kind of the, the, the shibboleth that, that big government is bad government and we need to cut back on useless, fatty government spending that only benefits liberal elites, um, that, that really vital social role that's never been more important is uh, in danger of slipping away. I, I gave the keynote at the Massachusetts Library Association last year uh, and it followed the lunchtime business meeting. It was the worst, worst slot I could imagine because the lunchtime business meeting opened up with the chairman of the Massachusetts Library Association saying, you know, brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you we've been doing more with less lately, but I'm afraid it's time to start doing less with less. And uh, of course, many of you won't have a job by the end of the year. And now our keynote speaker, Cory Doctorow. Um, and that's the story I hear from library systems all over the world.
I, I am encouraged to hear that this is a theme that you're going to delve in more deeply in uh, the, the follow-up to Little Brother, in particular because of, uh, as you've talked about so openly, kind of how young adult fiction is, is different and allows you to engage in more of a, a dialectic with the reader, not necessarily because of, of the audience, but just it seems to be a different form from, mm -hmm. from other kinds of fiction. Uh, I, I want to shift again because we have so much ground to cover. You, you've been embracing kind of a, a creative fulfillment al almost from the very beginning of, of your career, rooted in a, in a, I think, in a very different world in terms of uh, low cost of failure through leveraging like the technology that you write about, how you make use of that to a variety of ends, uh, explained very well in, in Think Like a Dandelion in the collection and New York meets Silicon Valley. Uh, you've also been very open about your, your own recent experiments in, in the form of your short story anthology with a, a little help. Uh, do you see evidence that any of these lessons are sinking in among the incumbents as opposed to those who I think are already predisposed to be receptive to that message? So I think that we've, we've gotten halfway there. I see a lot of publishers and record labels and studios experimenting with online, but it still seem, feels like in some ways the experiments are too ambitious, so I don't see anyone saying let's just hire a developer for a year and come up with cool ideas and then iterate and see how they go. Um, instead what seems to happen is whenever anyone proposes a big publishing, uh, a publishing online initiative, it becomes a giant initiative, a giant very slow moving initiative um, that's entirely handled by an outsourced team so that there's no chance to revise it in the house. If there's a, you know, you come up with an idea, you, you build the platform, and then it turns out it's not doing exactly what you want. Rather than just calling down to the team that built it who are in the same building as you, you have to put out a new bid to tender for it to be, to be updated to suit your needs. And it's this very slow, plodding way of doing it. And they spend, and, and of course, if you're going to spend hundreds of hours in meetings, before you can do anything. It makes sense to build big projects. And so it seems like the scale of the project means that all the meetings are, uh, you know, means that you need a lot of meetings. The fact that you need a lot of meetings means that you need big projects. And, and um, it's kind of a vicious cycle. Uh, and then every now and again, I actually do hear it just, just retrograde retrogrades stuff. I was out for lunch with a publisher who's considering a, a um, children's book I wrote of mine, a, a picture book about a little girl who gets a huge pile of, of horrible little girl toys for her birthday and at night when the monsters come she uses them to slay them. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, the person who used to run the online department was at the meeting because he, uh, or used to run the kids departments at the meeting because he's now running the online department. And I said, so what's new in the online world of your giant publisher? And he said, oh well, we figured out what we're going to do for electronic review copies of our books. And, and I said, oh, that sounds cool. What are you going to do for electronic review copies of your books? You're going to send out thumb drives with it on 10 different formats. You're going to put an online repository and give me a login so I can download the review copies for myself. He said, no, no, we're not doing any of that. No, we're, we're doing DRM locked PDFs that you can only read on your computer. Uh, and, and, you know, leaving aside the whole, like, that won't run on any of the computing devices that I own. Um, there is the whole business of expecting reviewers to only review your books while they're sitting at a desk. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, there's this re um, story that comes up every year when the BAFTA Award um, DVDs go out, because the BAFTA is like the, the Academy Award in the UK, and they, um, they send out uh, DVDs to all the judges, and some of the studios are very uptight about this. And so instead of sending out DVDs, they send out uh, special super DRM DVDs that need their own DVD player that you have to kind of crawl around under your TV and brave the dust bunnies and rewire it just to watch these review titles. And over and over again when this happens, you have this recurring motif in the blogs of the people who are BAFTA judges going, I always get about a third more DVDs than I could conceivably watch as a judge. And it's really easy for me this year to figure out which third I'm not going to watch. It's the third that requires me to crawl around under my TV. Those are going straight in the bin. And, and you know, as a reviewer, I get 100 review books a month and I review one book a week. And so that's going to be really easy for me to figure out what books not to consider for review. It's the ones that I can't actually look at on any of my devices. <laughs> when you describe that super DRM'd player, I just I have this this uh, you know brass cogwork image, this Baroque overwrought yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> device. They are in fact they have lots of glue. They're glue oh, shot wow. and, and so on to stop you interfering with them. Um, it, but I mean, it, that seems to be like a, a signifier of, of what you're talking about, that their own sort of institutional culture, even if they, they get the seed of an idea, works against that. I, 
Are there any examples? Is there any, any cause for optimism that there's? Oh, sure. I mean, I think like Tor.com, which is something my novel publisher in the US and Canada is doing, which is really, they just, they spent a little money, they built a platform, they brought some developers in house, and they've just iterated it kind of every week. They've done a little experiment, and when it didn't work, they dropped it and tried a different experiment, and when it did work, they built on it. And they're very slowly identifying lots of tiny little niches that work very well for them. Uh, one of the things I enjoy most about your essays on the state of, of what we've been talking about, uh, industry, industries like publishing that are affected by uh, this proliferation of digital media, is that you also maintain the human elements, such as in your review of Chris Anderson's Free, mm -hmm. um, uh, where you remind us that the remaking of industries is rarely painless and it's more than okay to feel compassion towards uh, for those, those affected by, by the, the disruption, even as we champion that very, very uh, innovation. Or in uh, uh, the piece reports of Blogging's death, where you explain uh, Ripple's law as a reminder that media and forums are never completely replaced by the accelerating wave of the new. How do you think this fits into your advocacy, or, or, or does this idea fit into your advocacy in some way? Well, I mean, it's it is really vital when you're when you're advocating for a position to understand where the other side is coming from and to understand their legitimate fears and hopes. One of my great frustrations in fights about things like SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, are all the people who should be on the other side of the Stop Online Piracy Act fight on the side of, of fighting the bill, uh, but who instead joined with the forces endorsing it, like, like the AFL-CIO. Um, I have a friend who says just because you're on their side doesn't mean they're on your side. The AFL-CIO has been convinced that there are union jobs that are going to be lost in Hollywood if SOPA isn't passed. But what we know about, um, about uh, the relationship that trade unions have to uh, uh, internet censorship is never good for trade unions. The, my favorite example is from Canada where I'm from, where TELUS, which is one of the major giant national telcos, uh, their union went out on strike and they put up a uh, website about their demands and their, their dispute and TELUS responded by blocking the website and of course for all of their customers and of course among their customers was their entire union because if you work for TELUS you wouldn't be getting a competitor's internet service. Um, and I, I really think that this, this business where you have people for example who are uh, performing artists or writers or filmmakers who get on the wrong side of these things who assume that, that um, because copyright extends the benef extends benefits to their employers or to their financiers, that uh, expanded copyright will also serve them. A good example of that would be um, uh, anyone who makes music that involves samples. There was a very good book last year from uh, Kimber McLeod about the economics of sampling and how the laws have changed in sampling. And one of the things he does is price out what it would cost to produce the classic sample-based albums today. So these albums were produced before there was a settled practice and law of sampling and generally there was no permission sought or given. So these two albums, the highest grossing sample albums in the history of the field are um, the Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique, and Public Enemies, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back. Um, he calculated the cost of clearing the samples on those albums if they were to be released today and how much they, those albums would have lost instead of gained. So they were very profitable, uh, but if you cleared the samples, they would have lost money. And in the case of Paul's Boutique, it was about $18 million. And in the case of um, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, I think it was about $16 million. So going from being the top grossing of all time to these massive uh, black holes in the balance sheet of the, of, the, of the labels and the musicians. And so meanwhile, we have um, this proposal that's passed in the EU to extend the term of copyright on sound recordings by another 45 years. And what that means is that anyone who makes sample-based music is going to find themselves with a much smaller catalog of material to work with. You almost will never hear a contemporary song being released with more than two samples. It's almost impossible to profitably sample more than two songs in a commercial release. So they, it, it just there's a whole there's a whole um, genre that's just gone missing as a result of this. And a lot of those musicians would like to be part of it. But the other piece of this is that it's almost impossible to clear a sample if you're not signed to a label because the four labels control the majority of sampleable material, and the labels have a really bad deal um, that they offer to musicians. Um, you are obliged to take that deal if you want to sample at all and release a commercial recording because you just can't clear the samples under any circumstances. So not only does this curtail the kind of material you can produce on your own, 
uh, or, or under a label system, but it also forces you into the label system where you are subject to all kinds of very bad practices that have been thoroughly documented. It was only after Sarbanes-Oxley, for example, that the labels stopped routinely running third shifts on their CD pressing plants where they produced off-the-books off the copies of recorded music to be sold without any royalty being paid on it. Um, and it's just, it was just that Sox made um, uh, executive officers liable for false statements on balance sheets that ended that practice. Um, so it, 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 really, uh, it, it, it really is this kind of, to use the Marxist term, this kind of false consciousness that leads people who, are, who become the kind of human shields for bad uh, policy to, to willingly march into that, into that uh, area to say, oh, well, this is a labor issue, this is a, an artist issue, and so on. At the same time that, that you talk about these things that definitely are, are coming up in the world of, of, of what we work in on here at New America, at OTI in particular, in terms of, of technology policy, um, uh, intellectual property, how that, how that uh, invades in, in against that. Uh, in, the, in the final essay, you, you get at something else that I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts how that, that might permeate, or, or if it would permeate the same space, that, that lowering costs of production, that it, it just gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper for, you know, the, it used to be a pejorative to talk about a bedroom producer. I don't think that that's necessarily true anymore, that people can operate at a, a much sc smaller scale. And in terms of how you talk about, uh, in another essay, judging how copyright actually functions, we're producing far more culture. You know, and there's a good indicator. Uh, it's a bit dated in the book, the 29 hours a minute of YouTube video. It's now up to 48. I think it's more. I think it's uh, like 60. At RightsCon, uh, a yeah, month, month and a half ago, okay. it was 48. And it may, yeah, it may be accelerating. It may right. chart out some interesting curves. So I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts of, Will that make its presence felt that it's just at a certain point that that starts to push on a new front? Well, I guess, I guess the, the question is whether we can get out and whether the, this, this distributed low cost production can get out ahead of efforts to narrow the distribution channels and, and produce um, uh, new gatekeepers where, where, we, um, uh, where those gatekeepers have fallen away. I mean, it's not like people didn't want to make culture before the network gave us all a distribution channel. But it was impossible to get your work on TV, you know, apart from a few very anemic um, cable access uh, channels. It was very hard to get your work published and read. And, and you know, we, we, we are pejorative today about a website that is written by some individual that reaches a few hundred people or a few thousand people. Uh, we say, well, you know, that, what, what is that compared to the mighty empire that, that is falling around our ears that routinely reached millions and tens of millions? And, it's true that reaching tens of millions is a profound and amazing thing, and it's true that reaching hundreds is not in the same league, but com considered over the long arc of history, the idea of any one person having the ear of a thousand people puts you in the top you know, percentile of all people that ever lived. Um, being able to reach a million people puts you in the top tenth of a tenth of a tenth of a percentile, but you're still both in the top percentile. Um, the, the gift of the network, of the ability to reach these much larger crowds of people with your message, with your aesthetic, with your ideas, and to conduct that discourse um, is a really important one. I, I, I don't know um, how we can really say that uh, this just widely distributed privilege um, is worth so little that we're willing to set it aside in the name of rescuing a privilege that was so narrowly distributed, especially when there's not, the evidence isn't really clear that they can't peacefully coexist. I mean, after all, last year was the best year ever for the Hollywood box office, sur surpassing the second best year ever, which was the year before, surpassing the third best year ever, which was the year before that. Um, you know, reports of Hollywood's death seem to be grossly exaggerated, particularly in policy for where they're asking for special privileges. I think it's, it's made, that threat's made more poignant too by the fact that I think it's more than just a, a quantitative difference, more than a difference of scale. I think you, know, you talk about the, you know, kind of now the, the smallest feasible audience is maybe three or four for uh, mm -hmm. a YouTube video, for a blog, for uh, a micro blog, something like that. Uh, but to me, that, that, that speaks to that there's a, a different sort of connection at that scale than the experience of going to a crafted blockbuster or, mm -hmm. or a packaged hit on, on uh, the traditional distribution channels? Well, I think that the virtues of a new medium are always orthogonal to the virtues of the medium it, it, uh, it, it steals away from, it takes away from. I mean, when, when all we had were stages, every performance had to be staged. 
um, even the performances that would have worked better on a big screen. And so when a big screen came along, all of the stuff that was more screen-like left the stage, along with a lot of stuff that had been lurking in Potentia, waiting for the screen to emerge, that was so screen-like that you could never get it onto a stage. And you know, when the small screen appeared, when the TV appeared, it turned out that there were a lot of audiovisual material that, was, that had been shoehorned onto the, onto the big screen, or that had never emerged because of the big screen. And then YouTube has made those things emerge as well um, in comparison to the TV. And the virtues of the screen aren't the virtues of the stage. They're the opposite virtues. All the things we like about the stage, whether it's that um, high wire uh, act uh, tension of wondering whether or not someone's going to blow their line, or the intimacy of, of being able to just sit there and actually hear the sound coming at you, or the shared experience of sitting in a cave with hundreds of other people listening to it and all reacting and comment. I mean, you know, the um, people who study, for example, the biology of laughter tell us that we laugh harder in an audience than we do on our own. And the bigger the audience, the more the audience is laughing, the more, the, the more we all laugh together. Um, those are not the virtues that we have in our living rooms, and they're not the virtues necessarily that we have in a cinema. They're, they're all different. Um, and so today you have people deriding YouTube for its homespunness, for the fact that it's, um, it has low production values, for the, pack, for the fact that often um, the, the actual like, overt text of a YouTube video is, is nothing, and it's all subtext. It's all uh, someone speaking to someone else intimately in a code that only the two of them understand, like a high school kid talking about events that happened that day. And it's, it's, they remind me of um, uh, back in the early days of, of the internet and uh, mobile telephony, uh, sociologists were really fascinated by the fact that Japanese kids would send each other empty SMSs whose message was, I'm here, I'm thinking of you. Right? And, and you know, there's, there's all this, there's this stuff happening kind of beneath the surface there, and people make fun of it because they say, oh, it's banal. Um, and, you know, it, some of it's banal, and some of it isn't, and some of what's on TV is banal, and some of it isn't, but its virtues aren't the virtues of TV any more than the virtues of a, you know, post-Reformation, we Kirk on the Hill, were the virtues of the, of the cathedral, right? And it's possible to celebrate cathedrals and their majesty without wanting to go back to a world where we only have one church. Uh, and I feel like that's where, if we're lucky, we're going to get to with the internet. But we have to um, realize that we can't judge the new media on the old criteria. Well, you do hit on that in, uh, I believe it's uh, Untouched by Human Hands, uh, in a different space, in, in discrete manufacture, that there's a, uh, an interesting tension, a push-me-pull-you of what, what is a detraction today actually may become a virtue tomorrow, that, that uh, the corporate culture that, that so emphasizes uh, the finished, the, the gleaming, the high gloss, um, may shift to actually try to get at that authenticity, that, that, that bespoke nature. Yeah, sure. I mean, we loved, we loved streamlining because it hid the machine, and the machine was, um, you know, the, 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 the machine lurking under the cowling was like a, a kind of a, the, the lurking presence of the dark satanic mill, and the streamlining made it all go away again, and so it just became this kind of literally seamless thing that, that um, was almost magic. And now we, we spend fortunes on watches that have presentation backs so you can see the clockwork because the machine has been hidden for so long that now it's a, it, there's, a, there's a great virtue to being able to see it. Um, it you know, in the same way that like, um, the, the existence of a mechanism for f getting feedback about how, you're being, how your photography works, where you, every time you take a picture you can see what happened as opposed to waiting three months until you filled up the roll to get it back from the photo processor, has made us all such good photographers that now we're actually buying software to reduce the quality of our photos because there's a certain stagey posedness of the photos that we take. We don't cut off the heads anymore. We, we have composition by default now. Um, and so we add hipstamatic filters to make them look like real pictures again and not like Sears portraits. I'm going to uh, indulge uh, just once more before I turn over to the audience for any of the questions that you all have. No doubt you have plenty. Um, I'm, I'm really curious, uh, you know, as much as these, these collections have been great for kind of harvesting some of your thought, uh, have you given any thought to uh, kind of adding your voice to uh, some of the great voices like, like Zitrain and, and, yeah. and Bankler and others in terms of a, a more sustained 
kind of more yeah. encompassing. In fact, I've been going, work. as you might imagine, I've, I've had about 20 different versions of that proposal kind of half-baked on my hard drive. At one point, Jimmy Wales and I were going to write a book called uh, Edit This Book that would be a <laughs> potted history of Wikipedia. And then he went on to do Wikimedia and, or um, uh, Wikia and got very busy in the fundraising and we killed that project. And I've had multiple iterations of it over the years. And right now, the, the, the state of it is that I, I want to do a graphic novel about copyright. And I want to structure it around three ideas, the, the, the three laws that I've been talking about in talks. It's kind of a running joke. I, I once gave a talk to some publishers and I said, um, uh, you know, when someone puts a lock on, you, on something that belongs to you and doesn't give you the key, uh, it's not there for your benefit. We can even call that like Dr. O's law. And they thought that was all very funny. And I told my agent about this. And my agent used to be Arthur C. Clarke's agent. He's still Arthur C. Clarke's estate's agent. And he says, no, you can't have one law. You need three. <laughs> so I came up with three laws. The first one is anytime someone puts a lock on something that belongs to you uh, and doesn't give you the key, it's not there for, for your benefit. So that's people in the entertainment industry who find intermediaries putting DRM on their works, but also uh, people who buy those works who find locks on them. And so they can't use them in ways that are lawful but may gore uh, the vendor's ox. Um, and the second one is uh, 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 fame won't make you rich, but nobody ever got rich by being obscure, which is my corollary to Tim O'Reilly's uh, The Problem for Artists Isn't Piracy, It's Obscurity, because of course when people hear that they, they think, oh well I know lots of people who got famous without getting rich. Um, clearly this is insufficient, and it's true. Uh, the, different, the, the, the piece that's missing from that is you've never heard of anyone who is a commercial success in the arts that no one ever heard of. Um, being well known is a, is a necessary but insufficient uh, on its own condition for having a career in the arts. And then the third one is um, uh, information doesn't want to be free, people do. And um, it's the kind of it's the freedom stupid bit of this, where all of this stuff is kind of nice if we want to figure out how to give artists a living. And I'm all for it, being someone who quit his day job to feed his family from copyright in 2006. But let's not lose track of what's really going on here. In the name of defending artists' livelihoods, and without really providing them, um, we are building the fabric of surveillance and control and censorship into the fabric of the information society. And we are affecting things that are so much broader than this, than this narrow business of how we continue to make you know, police academy sequels. Um, and it's, 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 and that's, the, that's the meat of the matter, right? You know, it's, not about, it's, you know, it's not that information wants to be free. It's that we want to have free societies. We want to, we want to have a free future. And so I figured this would make a great kind of graphic novel that you pick up in the airport bookstore on the way to the quarterly sales meeting that you read in about an hour and a half. And it's punctuated with kind of one page uh, single panel New Yorker or XKCD style cartoons that you can stick on the wall of your cubicle. So I've been looking for the right graphic collaborator for it. I had two people in mind. Uh, one was um, Scott McLeod, who I had the same um, comics publisher as he does. And we'd, we'd spent an afternoon together in New Orleans last year where he told me that he was almost finished this book he'd been working on for seven years. So I sent him an email and said, hey, Scott, I hear you're finished that book you've been working on for seven years. Do you want to work on another one? And he said it was book one of three. So that's, that's another 14 years before he'll be available. And then I asked Randy Monroe. And Randy Monroe has got a, a member of his family who's very, very ill. So uh, he's not available either. So now I'm kind of floating around. And my comics publisher, which is first, second, is um, sending me lots of potential collaborators, none of whom have quite hit it yet. Because it really has to be not just someone who draws a script I write, but someone who works with me on it. But I think it's the right frame for it. I think a, a kind of breezy, looks like a business book on the outside, and then kind of catches you at the end with a, with a right hook about the, the bigger picture is, is exactly right. You know, that not really instrumental, like on the ground, news you can use approach, not a kind of highfalutin, here's how culture works and how, how we're undermining it, but like these are the business realities and here's how, how we can fix them book. So we'll see. It, 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 and right now I'm working on the sequel to Little Brother and I think I'll finish that by Christmas and if this happens it would be my spring project. Fantastic, thank you for thank you. giving us that insight. And with that I would like to turn it over to you all no doubt you have tons of questions. I believe there's a mic uh, in Preston, the back. yeah, in the back has a microphone. So again, I will remind you that we are recording and live streaming. So if you would uh, just be patient as we circulate the microphone around. Mike Nelson, Mike Nelson. with Georgetown University. Um, uh, hey, Corey. I've always been surprised that no one's sort of written the counterfactual. You know, what if instead of extending copyright, we had decided to start cutting it back and 
we ended up with a world with four or five year copyright terms. Mm. No, one, no one's really explained what that would mean. One thing it would mean is that current artists would have a lot more competition. The Beatles would, ha would be always there as a free alternative. And mm -hmm. Rock artists would have to be better than the Beatles, or at least more novel. And documentary film producers could do incredible things mm. with all the stuff that's out there. No, no one's kind of written the story. And I, I, I kind of wonder why that is, or maybe someone has and I haven't read it. But I, I just look at the benefits mm. and, and higher it's quality work. Maybe we have less work, right. but it's better. We don't have to sort through all the dross to find the better stuff. Maybe, maybe it's a different world that no one, ne no one has explained yet. It's, a, it's an interesting idea. It certainly would make a great little piece of fiction. Uh, Rufus Pollock, uh, Dr. Rufus Pollock, at, um, I think he's at Cambridge now, did a um, quantitative study of optimal lives of copyrights and concluded that a 14-year renewable once was was the which is what the original congressional deal was at the you know after 1776 that uh, that that was more or less optimal in terms of realizing maximum benefit for um, for creators and returning a healthy public domain. Just to follow up on that. Just just real quick, uh, why hasn't the Tea Party latched onto this? This is the founding fathers' intent. It's yeah. you know reducing government interference in the free marketplace, eliminating government-imposed monopolies. Actually, you know this is the question we had a roundtable earlier where we talked about this, and I think the main reason that that um, bad copyright policy gets passed, and the main reason that it's not a bigger issue, is that copyright per se, which is to say like um, uh, a healthy living for um, the entertainment industry and its and its supply chain is just not a very big deal in most people's lives or on the national stage. Um, a, it has very powerful lobbyists, and what it has is very important externalities, right? So as you know, as I was saying when I talked about the the the, the three laws, the, it, it's great to figure out how to provide a living to the entertainment industry, but. In the, in the grand scheme of things, the cost of what we're trying to do to save the entertainment industry and the thing that the entertainment industry contributes is not a major piece of, every, of everybody's lives. I mean, we all listen to music, we all like books and so on, but you know, food and energy and, and um, uh, physical security and all of those other things are, are loom so much larger, and as a result, for example, lawmakers tend not to be very well educated on it. At WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, the UN specialized agency that is responsible for copyright treaties, what I saw was that in almost every case, the delegates to WIPO were not copyright or, or other knowledge good experts. They were experts because they'd been sent from poor countries that sent small delegations to Geneva, two, four, six people, and they sent water experts, they sent education experts, they sent environmental experts, they sent agricultural experts. They didn't send copyright experts because if you can only send six people to Geneva to represent your national interests and you're Burundi, your national interest isn't how to serve isn't someone who's an expert in pharmaceuticals or, or, um, or filmmaking. It's someone who's an expert in agriculture and, and uh, public health. And so that's, that's, I think, one of the major reasons is you have policymakers who just don't have a background in a fairly technical and what should be a fairly boring and off-to-one-side issue. Any more questions? Yeah. Here in front. Hi, Corey. Uh, Ernest Lilly, uh, TechMonkey, uh, TechMonkeyMag.com. Uh, the talking about um, qualifying publications. Uh, don't you think that there will emerge uh, a number of of indices that people can use to just sort of say, well, well, this this is how much trust factor each of them has. So I, I've. Uh, certainly, that's something that's that's been proposed lots, and it's the basis of Google's underlying um, citation analysis. Uh, I think that that doesn't necessarily help you navigate authority particularly because for one thing it seems to produce these little bubbles of, of non-interlocking authority like you know 9-11 truthers for example or, or birthers or whatever where you can find this like densely interlinked cluster of people who are authoritative in respect of one another who bubble up a lot of authority for their for for something that is you know kind of considered empirically not not very likely to be true. Um, the other thing about it is that uh, you know cryptographers talk about a Sybil attack on this, and it's it's become uh, it, it's a it's a class of attacks where it, what seems like an expensive thing to do to get a whole bunch of people to get, to gang up to bubble something up to the surface or bring something down below actually turns out not to be a very high cost relative to the potential benefits that can be reached. So one of the major issues I think facing um, 
the whole planet right now that no one's really latched onto, apart from the security press, is the uh, impl coming implosion of the uh, public key infrastructure um, cryptography stuff that SSL is grounded in. It's, it's what allows you to connect to your bank so that your bank knows that you're you and you know that you're your bank, that they're your bank and that it's not someone in the middle like harvesting your password and login. And this is a really big deal because, um, for example, we now have malicious software in the wild that looks like a signed Adobe updater for Flash. Um, and it has a valid cryptographic signature indicating this really came from Adobe. That's a rootkit. And you know, the things that rootkits can do now are, are even creepier than what they could do a few years ago. As we learned with the Lower Marion School District in Pennsylvania, rootkits can do things like remotely activate the camera on your computer without turning on the little green light and the microphone as well as logging your keys. And when the rootkit's on your phone, it can log your location and also record your phone calls and all these other things. I mean, the potential for malware is, is huge and our major buttress against it is, um, is crypto signing. And the way that crypto signing works is there are hundreds of entities around the world who are entitled to crypto sign. Um, uh, and if any one of them signs uh, a certificate saying this certificate belongs to Microsoft and anything signed by it, it comes from Microsoft, unless you take a fairly subtle and in-depth analysis of your software update or your web session, you can't tell the difference, neither can your computer. And if you have auto updating turned on, it just happens in the background. So uh, the Wall Street Journal, Thomas, you were telling me you had this piece this week about, um, uh, about lawful interception hardware, spyware, that um, will push uh, signed updates to mobile phones or signed iTunes updates that root your computer. Um, and it's used theoretically by law enforcement agencies, but it's also sold to repressive governments. Also, once your computer has been infected, there's the potential for third parties to infect it and so on. This is the same uh, problem in a different guise because your computer's trying to figure out who to trust. And right now, the way that computers do it is we say, well, the consortium that decided who can have signing certificates is made up of sober-sided grown-ups, and they only pick good people. Um, and those people are totally trustworthy and whenever they have a breach, they report it in a timely fashion, so certificates can be re revoked. This turns out to be totally untrue. And not only is it untrue, but it's untrue in like important and predictable ways. Like um, there are lots of government agencies, or lots of um, uh, quasi-governmental agencies or uh, entities like incorporated entities who have a, a lot of potential for pressure from their governments, who it seems get pressured by their governments to issue certificates by governments that want to spy on people. Um, in addition to a lot of them just being run by, you know, Muppets. So like the, the um, uh, Danish security uh, or Dutch um, certificate authority that was hacked by either an Iranian hacker or the Iranian government, depending on who you believe, that then had issues from uh, certificates issued for Microsoft and Google and so on so they could read email, tap Hotmail sessions and, and Google sessions and, and um, uh, Facebook sessions and so on. And then l this signed malware from uh, Adobe that wasn't really from Adobe was signed by a certificate issued by the Malaysian Agricultural Institute, which for some reason is a certificate authority trusted by every browser in the world. And they had lost control of their signing certificate years ago and never reported it. Um, and so these have been floating around in the wild, you know. So um, this is this is uh, this authority problem is bigger than just whose newspapers do you trust? And right now we have Moxie Marlin Spike, who's a cryptographer, who's proposed. Well, maybe you could have a quorum. You know, you ask lots of certificate authorities, is this a valid certificate? But you know, users are going to have a, the same hard time parsing that out that they do parsing out information about which news sources to trust, which is your computer throws up a cryptic message saying five out of seven certificate authorities say that you're really talking to your bank, you know, click here to continue. And <laughs> they're either going to say, they're either going to click continue and, and like just hope that they, you know, pretend that they never saw it and, and just totally put it out of their mind and have this nagging fear that their net worth is going to go down the tube in the next week or two, or they're going to cancel and hide in a bunker. Neither one of those are good outcomes. Yochai? Um, yeah, I'm Yochai Benavi. I'm the policy director at uh, Access, accessnow.org. Um, I actually wanted to go back to sort of the previous question on Burundi and sort of ask a follow-up question, which is we see sort of the models of copyright uh, legislation enforcement through the DMCA and sort of through um, sort of ACTA and, and sort of these models that sort of spread throughout the world, especially through trade agreements. Um, and, and we're seeing especially the USTR, the US Trade Representative, sort of pushing um, these models through, through bilaterals, actually, and not just multilaterals like ACTA and the TPP. Um, 
is there perhaps a sort of different copyright model that would be more appropriate to developing and emerging markets um, and economies? Um, and what would the tenets and features of that sort of developing world copyright model look like? It's an interesting question. I mean, we've seen bits of it in things like the Access to Medicine Treaty, where um, developing nations are extended the right to produce under a compulsory license life-saving medications that still compensate um, the uh, uh, pharma companies, but compensate them at a level that's commensurate with the, the, the ability of the people there to pay and, and tries to balance out those two things. Um, I, 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 I've just read a pre-press of um, uh, Bill Patry's next book, which is called How to Fix Copyright. And Patry, uh, of course, used to be the um, copyright counsel to the House and was uh, uh, copyright counsel in the Copyright Office and is now head copyright counsel for Google. And he actually has a, a fairly common sense two-prong approach to fixing copyright everywhere, not just in the developing world. He says, step one, stop making copyright laws. Step two, take all the copyright laws in the book and produce evidence-grounded impact statements for them to figure out whether or not they do what they're supposed to. Um, and then, once we've done that, we can probably find a path through. But he says that anything, until you actually have an evidentiary basis for copyright, anything that we do is actually just, just you know, throwing darts in the dark. Um, and I, I'm inclined to agree. I, I don't really have a plan because I think that we don't, we have such a, a kind of, um, you know, noisy flying spaghetti monster hairball of, of copyright laws now that um, it would be great to just kind of refactor them. Sometimes you just want to go back and find out what's working. Uh, and we don't know. I mean, is the DMCA doing what it's supposed to when it makes it illegal for you to write a piece of software for my iPad and then for you to sell it to me without Apple's permission? Is that what the DMCA meant, that rights holders shouldn't be able to legally sell products to their customers? I don't think so. You know, maybe we can figure, maybe we can get some facts into evidence and start, and then start figuring out what would work. Other questions? Uh, Greta? <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Greta. I work here at the Open Technology Initiative. I'm a policy analyst. And um, you alluded before to the difficulty of um, creating sort of a public outcry against some of these issues because of their complexity and the fact that it's hard to um, you know, get people behind something that you, it takes you a really long time to explain. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something we come across a lot here when we're working on things like spectrum policy. So I'm just wondering if you can suggest any tools or strategies to reach a broader audience. And mm -hmm. I think you've spoken a little bit um, in terms of your comic book and also uh, or sorry, graphic novel, mm -hmm. and also um, Boing Boing is a good example, but um, like, what else could we do in the policy space, mm -hmm. in the think tank space, that would get at some of the things you're talking about? So the, the, the way I've been trying to frame this lately is, is to say there's no copyright policy, there's only internet policy, and there's no internet policy, there's only policy. So that is to say that everything that we do with copyright right now that uh, ends up affecting the whole internet. We don't know how to make a copyright policy that allows for expeditious takedown from YouTube that, of uh, copyright infringing material that doesn't bite people in the Middle East who are participating in the Arab Spring who want to upload their videos in an expeditious way without having them taken down by false flag operations, for example. We don't know how to create a three strikes regime that knocks people off the internet if they're downloading movies without authorization but doesn't take away the benefits that the internet delivers to them and their family like um, all the better outcomes they get. In the, in the UK, there was a study that showed that the poorest, most vulnerable families, when, when they had the internet, they had like better nutrition and better jobs and better education, more social mobility and all those other things. So that we can't isolate out you know, the, the just, just the copyright bit. We end up making the internet, the whole internet, uh, change when we, try to, when we try to fix copyright. And then because everything we do today involves something with the internet, and because everything we do tomorrow will require something with the internet, um, we, we, uh, every time we, we, we make an internet policy, we just make a policy. It just becomes part of how everyone ends up living their lives. And I think that we have one benefit in this framing, which is that it becomes more obvious with every day that goes by. Right? There are more groups of people coming online doing more diverse things every day. I mean, a few years ago, it would have been a little weird to say, well, the internet is life. But today, 
how many people do you know who would be out of a job without the internet? And not just, and not just people who work in you know, white collar middle class professions, but increasingly people who are really economically marginal whose major source of income is whatever, finding stuff at Goodwill and selling it on eBay, or doing phone bank work on an occasional basis using voice over IP, or any of those other really marginal, sort of at the bottom, 99% kind of jobs that are also um, a big piece of how the internet uh, is delivering uh, value to people. So that's, that's one area that I think works very well for us and, and that um, we've got a, a future in. In terms of like regulatory circles, the thing that I, I think we, have, we struggle with is that we've historically divided the regulatability of things based on whether or not they were general purpose. So if I said, you know, you've got a, uh, uh, that, that's a nice wheel you've invented, but burglars might put it on their cars and drive away from bank robberies with it, can't you fix that? You would say no, and no one would think that you were being a jerk for saying no, because of course you, you would lose the essential wheelness of the wheel if you tried to make it a burglary proof wheel. But if I said, you know, I understand why you want a hands-free phone in your car, but we're having lots of hands-free accidents, and I want a rule that says you can't build hands-free phones into cars, you might disagree with the rule, but no one would say, well, then you're destroying the automotive industry, and we, wouldn't, we won't have cars if you make that rule stick. Um, we think of cars as special purpose devices that can be regulated, and wheels as general purpose that can't be. Wheels are simple, cars are complicated. The internet is something that is both complicated and general purpose. And so we think we can say, we like your general purpose computer, but there's, there's this one program that really upsets us. It's the program that copies this stuff, or it's the program that allows a software-defined radio to make airplanes fall out of the sky, or it's a program that allows the 3D printer to print an um, AR-15 full automatic uh, modification kit. Can't you just make me a general purpose computer that runs all the programs except for this one? And we don't know how to do that. And, we, and, and you know, the, the, it's probably impossible. And the closest we can approximate it is we can build a computer with spyware in it. And so um, getting regulators to kind of come to that and understand that computers, although they're as complicated as a car, are as general purpose as a wheel, and the same is true of the internet. We don't know how to make an internet that will allow any two people to communicate any message except for the message that upsets you. Um, and so once, we, once, once that regula regulatory norm has been internalized, I think a lot of the crazy stuff goes away. And until it's internalized, I think it's going to get worse because the copyright fight is just like a a warm-up for the fight over software-defined radio, over um, uh, um, 3D printing, and over lots of other things. There's, you know, we, a lot of things that we think of as being you know, um, uh, special purpose devices are really general purpose computers. A 747 is a flying Solaris box with some SCADA controllers. Uh, you know, cars are computers you ride in. Um, you know, pr 3D printers are just peripherals connected to computers. Uh, they're all just, you know, the, the general purpose computer is the, th is the thing. It's, the 21st, it's what the 21st century is made of. Anyone else? Yeah, in the back. Um, hi, Lynn Meyer. Um, one of the first questions you were asked is what you are afraid of for the future generation. Mm -hmm. um, what are you most excited for, for the next generation? Hmm. What am I most excited for? Um, well, I guess you know it's the it's the it's the inverse of this this business I talk about where copying will never get harder. So I try to imagine. You know, I always say to people like I'm not a, I'm a science fiction writer, and science fiction writers suck at predicting things. We've got a you know worse track record than a random number generator. But the one prediction I'll stand behind is that copying is not going to get harder. And then I always say, you know, our grandchildren will marvel at how stupidly hard it was to copy things in 2011. And, and I try to imagine that conversation, you know, tell me again, Grandpa, of when it took an appreciable amount of time and there was some incremental cost associated with copying every work of art and culture ever created. Um, that's, that's pretty awesome to contemplate. I mean, not least because, you know, when I was 17 years old, the only thing I wanted to do was copy stuff, right? I mean, whether it was artistically, you know, the way I learned to be a writer was, was by copying um, the writers I loved. I mean, there's a reason that if you walk around in Florence, in every corner there's a statue of the David. You know, for 500 years you've been learning to be a, a sculptor in Florence by copying the David. You know, the attics are filled with them. They've got a you know glut of Davids. They've got a they're they, you know they're in danger of having David quakes. So you know um, that that's kind of great, right? And then the other thing I did when I was a teenager is I copied as a means of kind of both I, both creating my identity and creating a shared identity among my friends. You know, the the mixtape was kind of the atomic unit of social commerce, and so. Uh, I, I love the idea of the palette expanding so radically and the participatory stuff expanding so radically. 
Um, it really gives me some hope. The other thing that gives me hope is that a lot of the problems that seem intractable today uh, are collective action problems, um, you know, climate change and so on. Um, and collective action problems are the kind of thing that the internet is really, really good at solving because one of our major collective action problem, one of the major sources of a collective action problem is that um, forming a coalition is expensive, right? Getting together with other people is expensive. Uh, you know, the left has long been derided for, um, uh, you know, identifying its, its fellow travelers as its own worst enemies. You know, I can't go into coalition with you because although we agree on nine points, we disagree on a tenth. Um, but I think that the, the reason for that is that expending a lot of energy to form a group seems like a waste of time if you know that it's going to be driven apart by its, by its fractures uh, in, the, in, you know, in a short order because there's some, some intractable difference between us. But when forming a group becomes cheap, we can make coalitions of interest that just come together and then come apart again. You know, we have this impoverished description of left and right, when really, you know, we need this multi-dimensional grid that's like left and right, centralized, decentralized, authoritarian, anti-authoritarian, spiritual, materialistic. And um, the reason that we just stick with this stupid left-right, you know, two-party dichotomy is because it just costs so much to form a DNC or an RNC for every point in that six-dimensional grid. Um, but when you can do it, you know, as easily as, as forming a mailing list, um, I, I have hope for our ability to really express uh, um, our common cause with one another in ways that is, that are, that's much closer to kind of um, what we really believe and what we hope. Uh, and that would be really wonderful. Um, you and the, uh, do we have, okay. Is there so someone who hasn't asked a question before we go back perhaps. to seconds? Is there, or is it just you two? Okay. Okay. Mike Nelson again. I love your image of the multidimensional political space because I'm a card carrying member of the cyber libertarian Democrat yeah. Facebook group. Right. <laughs> and I wanted your thoughts on this uh, experiment going on right now called uh, the um, AmericansElect.com third party movement. Uh -huh. They've gotten $20 million so far, and they're uh -huh. breaking the duopoly of the parties to put a third party candidate on the ballot in all 50 states. Wow. They're gonna pick the candidate through an online convention. They're gonna determine the platform of the party through an online party develop, uh, platform development effort. Are you familiar with this? Do you think there's any chance this no, kind of thing could happen? No, but it like the problem is fractal, right? Because they've got a collective action problem of like everybody is going to sort of, rather than vote for their first choice, go for the electable guy. And so you're going to end up with kind of exactly, it sounds like it, unless they've got, I mean, I this is why I like weighted ballots, weighted preferential ballots, is because they, it, 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 it's, it's a way of solving the collective action problem. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a card-carrying member of the Liberal Democrat Party for my sins in the United Kingdom. And, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't think of cutting it in half and mailing it back to party headquarters because I'm so disappointed in what the party's done. But I think the reason the party did it was they saw an opportunity to get weighted ballots on, um, in, the, in the land, which was in fact scuttled. But they felt like if they could just solve the collective action problem of no one wanting to throw away a vote, um, of being able to first say, well, if all my neighbors see, you know, have in their secret heart of hearts a desire to vote Liberal Democrat, I'll vote Liberal Democrat too. But if it turns out they don't, I'll vote for whomever it is my, my, you know, the mainstream party is. They were willing to spend you know, 10 or 20 years without attracting a single vote. You know, this, this business of we've, the Democrat Party has lost the South forever, kind of, or for a generation business of um, the civil rights movement. It, it, they were willing to spend a generation in the wilderness if it got them uh, preferential weighted ballots. Uh, and, you know, not even the ideal preferential weighted ballot, just any preferential weighted ballot, which is better than a first-past-the-post system. Um, and I think that until you get that, you've, it doesn't matter that there's $20 million. It doesn't matter that there's a candidate. I mean, I laud the effort, but it doesn't matter that there's a candidate on every, in every um, ballot. I mean, we've got that in Canada. We've got that in the UK. We've got that all over the world. Anywhere you don't have a preferential ballot, you've got thriving third parties, except for the UK, that are on, that have candidates on every ballot in every district, and they don't get elected. They sometimes form a swing, but they don't get elected because no one wants to throw their vote away. And it's only when you have uh, some other way of solving the um, collective action problem that people actually vote for third parties. I think we have time for one or two more. Um, since you've asked, yeah, we'll go with the gentleman in the back. And then we'll come back to you if we have time. Thanks. People rejected DRM in music, and we were able to make that stick. That hasn't happened in movies and books. Uh, does that ever get turned around? 
I hope so. I mean, um, I think that it wasn't even so much that people rejected DRM and music. I actually think what happened was, if you read, Stephen Levy wrote a really good uh, biography of the iPod. I, I forget what it was called, it was something like iPod. I mean, it was one of those snappy <laughs> Stephen Levy titles, hackers, iPod. Um, and uh, one of the things in that was the story of how Steve Jobs talked the record industry into putting the catalog into uh, the iTunes store. And it started with, iPods only have FireWire, and only Macs have FireWire, and only Macs have iTunes, and um, Macs are only 5% of the world. Try this little experiment over here. And um, it was successful. And then he went back to them and said, we're rolling out a Windows version. Uh, and um, the only, s do you really want to go in the midst of your petitioning for special privileges in Congress, do you really want to go to them and explain why you've just killed the only successful music retailing online service ever invented? And they let him expand it out to Windows. But of course, Steve Jobs had offered them DRM, and they took him up on the offer. And what they found was after a couple of years of this, that there was billions of dollars being sunk into formats that were locked to Apple's platform. And they started to go, well, wait a second. If we decide to make our own platform, or if someone else offers a platform that gives us a bigger piece of the action, or lets us set our own prices, or do any of the other things that we really want to do, we're going to have to rely on our, Apple's never going to license their DRM for a competitor's device. We're going to have to rely on our customers being willing to either juggle two devices or throw away every dollar they spent on our stuff with Apple because the DMCA doesn't let us authorize them to break the DRM. Only Apple can do that. And so that's when Amazon came along and said, well, we have a solution to all your problems. We'll just put it in MP3, which had been unthinkable before that. But MP3 was an interesting bit of, of judo. It was kind of like shooting the hostage here. Because rather than saying, well, if we go to a competing DRM platform, um, Apple won't let us unlock and relock the media. They said, well, if we went to a no DRM platform, then that media will play on Apple's thing, because Apple's platform plays no DRM media. And, um, and we can start to edge out Apple with a competitor. And that, I think, is the, the analysis, the, uh, uh, the right analysis of how DRM and music died. The problem with, say, audiobooks right now is that 90% of the audiobooks are sold by an Amazon subsidiary through Apple's iTunes, and they have a mandatory DRM policy between the two of them. And not only is there no competitor, but they now control 90% of the market. Not 90% of the downloadable market, 90% of the market. The CD market for audiobooks is, is all but gone. But yeah, I know you meant books in general, but here's an example of a m more mature um, online market, because books in general don't have a, a mature online market yet, but audiobooks have really matured into what economists told us would happen with the DRM marketplace, which is a winner-take-all marketplace where you've now got 90% locked in, and rights holders can't get it, can't, can't sway them. You know, Random House, which is Bertelsmann, which is the largest publisher in the world, took my novel Little Brother, the New York Times bestseller, and went to them and said, we'd like to sell this without DRM. This isn't, you know, like some, some little tiny publisher. This isn't a little tiny book. And they said, we have a mandatory DRM policy. If you want it in the iTunes store, that's the only way we're going to sell it. Um, and you know, that really uh, doesn't bode well for a future without DRM on audiobooks, because the lock-in is now so thoroughgoing. And unlike uh, a song, where it's a 99 cent download, some audiobooks are 50 or $70. Um, and they can't be trivially ripped either. You can't, you can't burn them to a CD and rip them again because you end up with um, the track ending in the middle of a sentence and you have these big breaks in it. It's really unwieldy to break the DRM off of them. So I really, I actually worry that that market may be lost, which is a pity because I like audiobooks. So do we have time for one more question? And then if it's quick, yeah. is it quick? Ernest? Yeah. So if you want to just bring the mic up. Uh, Ernest Lilly, Tech Monkey. A uh, little bit of a shout out. Um, for the win, sat on my Tubi Red Pile for way too long. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but now I'm, I'm more, most of the way through it. And it's a lovely treatise on virtual economics. Mm -hmm. um, do you game? Do I game? N a little bit, but I got most of my gaming stuff um, by living with a gamer. My wife used to play Quake on the national English team. Uh, and uh, <laughs> then became, uh, the, ran the game strategy for the BBC, and then um, ran the game strategy for Channel 4 as the Commissioner of Education there, and, and was commissioning a dozen games a year, plays a couple of, in a couple of serious guilds, 
And I, you know, a, a, a fun evening in the Dr. O'Taylor household uh, involves me sitting on the sofa watching Alice kill zombies. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, we've got like nine consoles hooked up to the TV. We actually had to get like another splitter for our splitter so we could hook all the <laughs> consoles up. So I game a little, and certainly that was my homework when I was researching the book. I'd have it on my to-do list, you know, answer email, uh, uh, check, check, you know, check the uh, banking, uh, pay the bills, play World of Warcraft for an hour, uh, read a book about China, you know. So um, the, the next book is more, way more up my street. The next young adult novel is called uh, Pirate Cinema. It'll be out in September. And it's, it's you know, it's a rollicking novel about a, a youth gang in Britain devoted to destroying the entertainment industry before it can destroy British society uh, by making pirate movies and screening them in underground cinema, in underground sewers and uh, um, uh, old cemeteries and squatted pubs and stuff. Well, thank you all very much. There's some time to sign books and, and talk one-on-one. On one. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, New America Foundation, for hosting me. And <laughs>